Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee 2020. We have received apologies today from Good Donald Cameron and Donald Martin. First item on our agenda is an evidence session on the budget 2021 to 2022. The committee's approach to scrutiny of the budget reflects the approach recommended by the Budget Process Review Group and entails addressing budget implications throughout the year to bring together to inform a pre-budget report for consideration. This year, we are also uh, considering the impact on health and social care of COVID-19 in the current financial year. And we are taking evidence from a number of relevant bodies before hearing from the Cabinet Secretary. This is the third of the series of meetings, and today we are hearing from Chief Officers of IJBs, and I welcome to the committee uh, Judith Proctor, Chief Officer of Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership, Vicky Islands, Chief Officer of Dundee Health and Social Care Partnership, and Eddie Fraser, Chief Officer of East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. We will take questions in a pre-arranged order. Uh, I will start with the first questions and then ask each member in turn to ask their questions. As ever, it would be helpful if members could indicate when they've reached the last of their questions in order to assist broadcasting colleagues to move on. Likewise, uh, if uh, uh, witnesses wish to uh, come in and uh, answer a question, in addition to a question and answer that's already been given, please indicate to the chat function. Can I start? Clearly, the um, uh, COVID-19 has changed uh, many things in the way we all work, uh, and not least in the areas for which health and social care partnerships are responsible. Uh, so, can I? start with a, a, a general question uh, and, and ask our witnesses whether the existence of your organisations of the health and social care partnerships, did the existence of IGBs assist with the response to the pandemic? And if so, in what ways? I wonder if we could start with Judith Proctor. Yes, uh, good morning, convener. Good morning, committee. And uh, thank you for hearing from us today. Uh, I, I think my answer to that would be a, a resounding yes. I think the whole approach to integration, having integrated teams, being able to mobilise across our whole system with our partners uh, was a significant contributor to our ability to mobilise um, across our city and across Scotland. I think some of the, 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 the barriers in terms of um, inter-organisational barriers disappear. Uh, and we were able to move our our staff uh, uh, across areas. We were able to support areas where we knew we were going to have significant pressures, uh, and we were able to take a really holistic approach to how we supported people at home in care homes. And I think the way that we worked with the secondary care uh, and acute care again demonstrates our ability to to move swiftly. So I, I would say absolutely yes. Thanks very much, uh, Vicky Irons. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I would also endorse the comments that Judith Proctor has made about the initial response. I think um, the thing that has certainly benefited uh, both Dundee City and the rest of Scotland is already the foundation of partnership that exists across the city, uh, particularly on, at the outset um, of this pandemic. We saw COVID presenting in communities and not necessarily in the way that we predicted um, in terms of a huge surge for hospital-based activity. So we have really depended on uh, the full support of our local authority colleagues in being able to bring together new services that needed to be configured very, very quickly, um, but also the wider partnerships that are engaged in our IGBs, such as the voluntary sector, to ensure that we provided essential services, particularly for those who were shielding um, and those with very complex needs. And without a doubt, we've seen a very large transformation of the type of care that we can now provide in community settings as a result of that. So I think if we hadn't have had the foundation of these partnerships in place in Scotland, our response would have been very different. Thank you. Any please. Thank you and good morning, convener and committee. Obviously building on you know what my, my colleagues have, have said. I think some of the areas in, in particular, if we think about it, eh, and if I use that example that Vicky gave around shielding, so, so I led for both the council and for the NHS here, Sir Naren, in terms of, of shielding. We were able to join these things up 
and make sure very quickly that people who were shielded got the essential practical supports like shopping, like support with prescriptions, that there was no you know, differentiation uh, between that. In other areas, we were able to build in long-standing work. So, for instance, we had already you know, weekly meetings with care homes, and that was very quickly able then to bring in public health and a range of other professionals when that was required. And therefore, the relationship in terms of going forward has been built stronger rather than being fractured uh, through this. And one of the other areas I would reflect on is if we weren't sitting in a, an integrated environment, there would have been a real risk of bickering over budgets and who was paying for what. Actually, essentially, in local communities, it didn't matter because the chief officers were responsible across the health and the care budgets, and therefore were able to take decisions and act under, you know, the, the auspices of the IGIB. So I do think, right across the whole system, you know, sitting there as an interface between the NHS and you know councils, but also importantly with the third sector and the independent sector, the role of IGIBs has been essential in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I ask? Judith Proctor, what the key challenges have been for integration authorities uh, and whether uh, the experience of the pandemic has changed your perspective on what the challenges are for integration authorities in general? Judith Proctor. Um, I think o o over this, um, some of the key challenges that, that we saw for the integration authority um, in a way, disappeared. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about the IGB itself, um, we worked very early on to ensure that we had good and appropriate governance within the, the, the IGB so that it could undertake its strategic decision making. But in large part, the responses that we put in place were operational through the Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, so I, I, I think we need to make a distinction between those two things. So our IGB uh, enabled um, emergency decision making to, to be undertaken by myself and in partnership with the chair and the vice chair of the IGB. And of course, we as chief officers, as Eddie have say, has said, are responsible both through the NHS and the local authority. So we were working very, very closely with the incident management teams, the Gold Command and both those organisations so that we can make decisions really swiftly. Um, and quick decision making and appropriate decision making was really of the essence at the, 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 the height of COVID. Uh, so I, th I think some of those things um, were um, that, that sometimes can be challenging in terms of the, the, the speed at which we make decisions. They disappeared through 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 COVID, um, and uh, again, you know, we've, we've touched on this with mobilisation plans and, and the funding. I think some of the issues in relation to funding, being able to make decisions, and uh, knowing that the funding would be made available for us to ensure that those services and those responses could could be put in place, and um, that also. Um, ensured that some of the usual challenges that we face uh, were not in place o over COVID. Um, not sure if that actually addresses the, the question that you were answering, but happy to, to follow up on that if there's a follow up. I, I think it does. Thank you. Uh, and can I ask uh, Vicky Islands? We've heard from both uh, Judith Proctor and Lady Fraser about uh, working between integration uh, partners within authorities. Uh, is, is it also your experience that there has been effective joint working among health boards, local authorities and IGBs uh, to ensure prompt action? And, and is it your experience and, and that of others that partners have been represented equally in decision making uh, through the pandemic? Vicky Irons. Thank you. Yes, um, certainly from my experience and to reflect also Judith's comments, um, moving into our pandemic response and emergency measures has in some ways liberated the system, I think, just to be able to get on and do the right thing. I think that's an expression used by one of our colleagues recently. And um, we have definitely witnessed a level of integration um, that maybe wasn't present um, prior to the pandemic response, or certainly not present at the pace at which change uh, was enabled um, during um, the early weeks of the pandemic response. Um, we have, as Judith has also highlighted, very robust um, processes in place in terms of our command centres, uh, both within the IGBs, and we also play um, a participative role in the NHS board arrangements and the local authority arrangements. Um, and as a collection of IGBs, uh, we were also in regular contact with Scottish Government officials um, and other key agencies, such as Public Health Scotland, throughout the process. 
Um, so for me, um, this has absolutely cemented um, some of those relationships um, and enabled the system really to develop one response, um, which was entirely necessary under the circumstances. Thank you very much. And can I ask uh, Eddie Fraser whether the experience of the pandemic has highlighted areas for improvement in the structures in place for decision making and in the allocation uh, of resources? Uh, Eddie Fraser. So, in terms of the the allocation of of resources, I think some of that uh, and the things that was reflected by the others is also down to the relationships between the organisations. So, if the relationships between the health board, the council, and the IGIB are strong, then some of the things that can be a delay because the trust between the organisations, you just go ahead and do the right thing. So, sometimes if you know you need to, you know, do things, then you go ahead and and do it. One of the areas that, that I certainly felt at the start, particularly, was a miscommunication with people. You know, so a miscommunication with the wider actual members of the, the IJB until we got all these different, you know, video conferences up and running. I think that was difficult. I think the the work we do as visible leaders out there, whether that's in care homes or people with learning disabilities or care experienced young people, not being able to actually see and hear from them easily to, to start with is difficult. So, so the, there are bits at the start of it that I think that you know like we we had to learn from and we had to learn how to communicate differently with people, and I dare say that's something we're going to have to continue uh, to learn with. And clearly, the worry is it's it's those who are have most difficulty accessing us because of our arrangements that is the ones that we're not able to to speak to enough. And I think that's some of the things we're having to learn different ways of communicating and make sure we continue to be uh, inclusive. It's very necessary for us to go into a command and control model in the middle of a crisis, but it's also very necessary for us as we go forward to make sure everything that we do is informed by our communities and is for our communities. Thank you very much. We heard from Vicky Irons about coordination with the Scottish Government. Can I ask Judith Proctor what is being done to ensure that positive lessons are retained once the pandemic is over, and how are experiences being shared across the country. Judith Proctor. Yes. Um, I, th I think perhaps the committee will be aware of the uh, several pieces of work that, that, that we've done in, in partnership with other organisations. A, a lessons learnt process was undertaken with colleagues in Scottish Government um, in around about uh, July or August, and I think that's been shared with the committee from uh, Eleanor Mitchell's uh, letter to you uh, last week. I think that was a really valuable piece of work, and whilst it focused on the, the front of it about you know lessons learnt in relation to the lead discharges, I, I think it looked across the broader spectrum of of, of our experience um, in health and social care partnerships over, over the pandemic. What worked well, what we were able to mobilise quickly, what some of the issues were, and how we retain those into the into the future. And we also, as a as a as a group of chief officers in health and social care Scotland, partnered with the BMA. Uh, and some work was done in relation to lessons learned around primary care, primary care's significant response early on through COVID centres, the way that they have retained services, different modalities, working through things like Near Me. Uh, and that's been a really valuable piece of work um, that we've shared across our, our, our network. And then I think we are all individually doing a lessons learned to capture. We certainly started that quite early on in, in Edinburgh from around about April started capturing uh, the lessons that we were learning. Uh, so that's been pulled together. We're disseminating that throughout our partnership. Um, Health and Social Care Scotland and the Chief Officers Groups are very strong, very supportive uh, collective of Chief Officers. And uh, that focus on sharing what we are learning as we go has really been a feature of, of the network from the get-go and has really been enhanced and accelerated through COVID. We, we met uh, daily with Scottish Government throughout the, the early part of the, the COVID in a teleconference, and uh, we are shaping our, our future agenda based on the what are the lessons that we take from COVID that we implement uh, across Scotland. So I think there's been quite a lot in that area. We're also, as a, as a network, doing some work with the King's Fund in relation to our personal experiences of, of leading through this, uh, and that work is, is ongoing at the moment. Thank you very much. And finally, can I ask Vicky Irons, uh, how to cast your mind back and, and, and tell us how early you and others were able to begin preparing for lockdown? Was was it a matter of days or, or, or weeks that you had to uh, uh, be be ready for that? And, and, and what planning took place for that? Vicky Irons. 
So I think we've benefited uh, largely from not necessarily having been able to predict uh, the scale and the length of this pandemic, but we've certainly benefited from having previously exercised plans for other pandemics, such as bird flu and um, um, other occasions. So we're already in a position where we had, if you like, a sequence of events in terms of how services may change. Um, and in the event of lockdown or the, in the event, for instance, of large absences from staff available at work, um, how we would prepare for that. So I think, um, in essence, we, we, we had a fair level of warning in terms of being able to prepare certainly our care and our service provision um, for the eventuality of lockdown. Um, I think some of the elements of that, such as uh, the shielding and the provision of care and supplies and medicine supplies and lots of other very practical things, uh, we had just a you know a number of days, if, if potentially a week's notice, to get those arrangements into place. But again, being in the position that we're in, particularly with the expertise we have with local authority colleagues around the table with all of their logistical expertise, we were able to kind of respond to that very quickly. And we'd already prepared, for instance, about how we would provide care if buildings were closed and um, how we would provide medicines and other essential supplies for those who are most vulnerable. Um, so most of those elements uh, really fell into place quite quickly. Thank you very much. I now call my colleague Sandra White. And good morning, panel. I would just like to follow on for the convener's questions in regard to additional funding for health and social care. Now, we know that the Scottish Government had committed £100 million pounds to that. Uh, first tranche was £50 million pounds funding, and then followed up by another £50 million. Pounds. Now, Judith, in, in your um, comments to the convener, you mentioned um, funding would be made available, and it was a positive aspect. But we have some concerns raised in regards to the submission from Edinburgh uh, regarding the funding received was not sufficient to meet the full cost of paying the living wage uplift, and also others have mentioned lessons learned report, where some concerns have been raised. Also, so can I ask you uh, a number of questions? Uh, are you confident, not just yourself, Judith, but others, that, you know, given the witnesses, that resources will be made available to meet the additional costs? identified in respect of health services, which IGB has responsibility, and also, which has been mentioned, social care services, which the IGB has responsibility also. Judith Proctor. So we, we've worked um, very closely with Scottish Government colleagues uh, over this in relation to, and with our health colleagues and with our local authority colleagues, in relation to the costs that are additional to our core costs as a result of COVID. Uh, so we're capturing those um, a, a, as we go. Um, we have um, resolved the issue in Edinburgh in relation to the, the living wage um, and are, are working on uh, being able to provide that with, with our partners. The IGB agreed that on the 24th of August, and it's been agreed by uh, Finance and Resources Committee and City of Edinburgh Council, and is now going to the full council uh, to be discussed, and uh, one anticipates a, a agreed there as well. So the, the living wage aspect of this has, has been addressed in, in Edinburgh, and we're looking forward to being able to to, to pay that to staff. Uh, I think the challenge of sustaining the, the, the COVID costs is going to be a, a, a very real one. I think our job here as health and social care partnerships is to be really, really clear about where our additional costs are being incurred uh, and making sure that in partnership with the councils and with the NHS uh, that we are capturing that and discussing those with, with Scottish Government. Um, I, I think in relation to um, some of the, the challenges around their sufficiency, uh, I think that probably relates to the unknowns in COVID. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. We're seeing some um, increases of the incident of the virus in, in some communities. And so there's, there's an issue of the, the length of time that it's going to be uh, that we're going to be working um, in uh, th this period. So I, I think some of the issues in relation to its sufficiency um, are very much related to the, the unknowable aspects of uh, living with COVID and moving through the route map. Sandra White. 
Uh, thank, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I just wonder if any other witnesses have any comments to make on that particular aspect of uh, health services responsibility. Uh, no one else wants to come in on that particular one? If not, I'll move on to my, my second. I think Vicky, Vicky uh, is suggesting perhaps that Eddie Fraser should respond in addition to that question. Eddie Fraser. Okay. Thanks, Computer. Um, so, so I think there are a number of, of issues around the, the, the funding. You know, so we as a, a, an IGIB in total anticipate there will be a nine million pounds extra cost to us uh, this year in terms of, of funding, and just now that's sitting at a, a net you know cost of about six million to us. That's not all direct IGIB because we also run many Panayersher you know services. So the COVID hub, etc., was all included in that, and these costs are all included in the mobilisation plans. You know that have been put to Scottish Government, and indeed later this afternoon we've got a feedback session with the Scottish Government eh, around that. But there are also a number of other things that we need to consider that are really required. The sustainability payments to our social care partners, we need to make sure that they are able to be, you know, sustained. Because if they're not sustained, it will just end up with first of all poorer care. You know, for people who receive these services, and secondly, it will be at greater cost with public services having to pick that up. So, how we work together eh, to do that is going to be one of the, the issues for us. One of the other issues, that's again one of the unknowns that you know that Judith spoke about, is you know what is this going to mean for how long it takes to do each individual social care visit? You know, in terms of putting on PPE and taking it off and still providing people with that level of care. The same with our community nursing services. So, actually, the same. Intervention has taken longer to actually deliver uh, in, in these cases, and we need to work out what that's going to uh, mean for us. The other areas that are important for us is whole changes in ways of services. You know, just now, if our day services are limited for both adults and for older people, we're having to change that to care at home services, and often that's a much more expensive model to actually deliver and make sure people uh, get that. It's also not the same because people are not getting the same social interaction. So going forward, how we deliver social interaction for some people who have been getting that in a different way are going to be some of the the, the costs to us. So I think there are, the, as we know, the, the the known knowns, and we're all working through that with mobilisation plans. But there are also a number of unknowns for us at present, and I think they are some of the biggest concerns for us just now. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. I'll take Vicky Adams as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, convener. Just just to build on comments from both Eddie Fraser and Judith Proctor, I think um, the issue for us moving forward, and certainly the cost of remobilisation, has had extensive work um, undertaken um, in connection with that, and certainly costs for Dundee City are sitting at around uh, just over sixteen million pounds uh, um, of the national funding. I think we've had about one point five released so far. So. We are entirely dependent on um, some of the assurances given at, at, at the outset about being able to respond to that level of financial risk. We do, um, incidentally, have a, a series of papers that have clearly been put forward in our local systems outlining the detail of that, um, if that is of interest um, to anybody. Um, the, the essential um, added um, issue that I would like to um, highlight is, is really about the next period of the COVID response um, and balancing that with demand that we will see naturally through the winter season, and particularly with the increasing um, flu immunisation programme and other immunisations that will hopefully come on stream. Um, but more than that, it is about a sea change in those people who are now requiring capacity for community-based care. Um, that has absolutely changed throughout the period of this pandemic. People are confident and people are asking for their care to be provided wherever possible, in their own homes or in community settings. Um, so we as an entire system need to be able to respond to that level of demand. And we need to retain some of the new developments that have emerged throughout the process to enable us to do that. But beyond that, I think we are now all seeing signs of a significant increase in demand for support for mental health issues and a huge level of anxiety across the population. This will undoubtedly have an impact, not just in terms of mental health, but physical health in the years to come. So we need to prepare ourselves adequately to respond to that. And inevitably, there will be a resource um, uh, implication of that level of demand for us all. So we need to understand those risks now 
and to a certain extent we need to undertake a fresh strategic needs assessment so that we can plan for that accordingly. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of hard work being put in there, and thank you all for the, the work that you are doing. We are talking about um, responses, and basically, what are the mechanisms for passing on resources to, uh, you know, for yourselves in, in social care? You mentioned the fact that you've had uh, Zoom meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, when you're speaking to the Scottish Government, whoever has given you the, the, the monies, uh, basically, have the responses that are being allocated been quick enough to, to cover what you're asking for? Um, Judith Proctor. Yes, I, I, I know one of the challenges that has certainly been raised by our, our colleagues in the third and independent sector has been about the speed with which the sustainability payments have, have been able to be made. Um, obviously, these have come into um, our organisations. They were passed on through NHS into local authorities, um, and our colleagues, the chief finance officers, had undertaken some some work. So, as far as possible, we were able to make this uh, uh, a similar process in all 31 health and social care partnerships. Bearing in mind that a lot of providers work across multiple partnerships, we wanted something that, as far as we were able to make it. Um, was was familiar in in, in different areas because there are different circumstances in in different um, authorities, different IGB areas. Um, so we developed a process. Obviously, we have to be mindful of our um, due diligence. Have to be mindful of our responsibilities for the public pound. And we did try uh, in that process to make something that was a, a relatively as light touch as we could make it in relation to the the release of the funding. So we did ask providers to. Um, uh, inform us what the, the funding was for, uh, and to give us some evidence of, 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 of their expenditure and, and the use of that funding. So we're certainly now, in my partnership, releasing um, increasing amounts of the funding that is, is due to our providers. But I, I know it was certainly a concern from providers and provider organisations early on that it just wasn't coming out. And I think they did feel that it was unfair that they were being asked to undertake some uh, processes of, of, of evidence that they maybe felt that we weren't subject to. Uh, I think we, we, we have indeed have to, had to demonstrate and justify the funding, the additional funding that we are uh, using as well. So uh, certainly speaking for Edinburgh, we're releasing the funding now. Thank you. And, and, and briefly also from Eddie Fraser. But just to say funding has come and support has come in a number of different ways. So one of the ways it's come that's been really welcome is with NHS support around PPE. So, so that direct delivery down through our local PPE hubs, you know, so it's really been funded centrally and going right out through the whole system. That that's been really welcome in terms of what we're doing. And at the same time, you know, like there've been other areas. So locally, when we've been buying PPE through the council, you know, this is all a matter of trust. So we've spent two million pounds in buying PPE directly through the council on the trust that that will eventually feed back through. But we've still went ahead and done it. So two things there. First of all, about the trust in terms of going ahead and doing it when it needs to be done. But secondly, there have been other funding mechanisms as well in terms of support of the social care sector, in particular uh, through PPE, that's been really welcomed. Sandra White. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, convener. I just wondered. I know that time is short. Perhaps could just give a written question, in, but for clarification, exactly what process you go through. But you know, we've had the NHS mentioned, then we've had the IGBs and the, the local groups. So I just wonder what hoops has got to be put through before the funding actually gets to the boss, to the people who's asking for it. And that, that's what I was looking for. I know the time's short. Perhaps you know. Something you could write in and let us know. Is it the same for all IGBs? Maybe just maybe just briefly, uh, Judith, if you could indicate uh, whether financial reporting requirements have changed and, and, and whether any of these changes might become uh, permanent. Uh, Judith, um, I, I think in terms of the, 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 the question about the process, I'm sure that uh, yes. we and our SCFO colleagues could uh, provide an update on, on, on the process and the mechanism by which uh, providers are asked to complete a form, uh, tell us what the additional funding is is for, uh, and be able to to demonstrate that. Then we release the funding. So that is the the the, the, the process for that. Uh, this is obviously a, a, the additional funding for 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 COVID costs. Mm -hmm. But okay. I'm sure that we'd be happy to submit that separately for your information. That that would be great. Uh, my final question, convener, if, that, if that's all right. 
Um, integration authorities really, really important that you've mentioned. Uh, you mentioned earlier about working closely with NHS boards. Has it worked very well for you in developing the uh, remobilisation plans? Have you had any problems in that respect? Um, Vicky Adams. Thank you. Um, I think our experience around the remobilisation plans has mirrored um, much of the earlier work uh, with the original mobilisation plans to some extent. Um, so all of that work has been done essentially as one system, um, and I think the drafts have been submitted to Scottish Government. Each of the IGBs have also, um, really um, referring back to my previous comments made around that kind of fuller strategic needs assessment, have undertaken a really thorough exercise in terms of remobilisation, um, really in terms of uh, being able to point towards the future in terms of service redesign, but also with ongoing requirements um, and accountabilities around the ongoing response to the pandemic. As, as Judith, I think, mentioned earlier, um, we still don't have the end in sight in, in relation to that, that response. So um, I think, certainly from my own personal experience um, in my system in Tayside, uh, the relationship has been positive and the outcome has been positive. And I think some of the gains I mentioned earlier, particularly are around lots of people practising with a community focus, lots of specialist uh, clinicians now providing care in people's own homes in collaboration with general practice. We want to retain all of those elements with the remobilisation plans. So um, I think if there's anything good to come from this, uh, those are the aspects which uh, you know we really want to hold on to. Um, I know that my colleague Eddie Fraser has also had a very integrated approach um, in Ayrshire, so I don't know if he'd like to add any comments. Uh, Eddie Fraser, briefly. Thanks, Kavina. Just as you know, Vicky said, it's been a very integrated approach. So to the point where that that community and primary end, you know, we wrote that end. We jointly with our acute college done the unscheduled care part. A colleague in North Ayrshire who leads in mental health wrote that part of it. So we've been fully integrated in terms of, of, of how we we do that and, and put that together. And indeed, it's been one of the things putting together that we're not only looking at immediate response, but we're also looking at how we go, you know, forward, you know, in terms of this. Because some of the things that we've learned here have to be things that we learn for the future. There's been lots of care being able to be provided in the community. One of my GP colleagues called it, she was able to do today's work today. And what she meant by that is she could speak to a patient, she could then phone up a you know, a specialist clinician and get advice back from there because there was space in the system to do that. And it saved big long waits for patients and things. So there is real learning that can go on from here. And there's some of the things that we've tried to reflect in the mobilisation plan. How do we maintain the good things that we did? And I think that throughout you know, our reviews of this has to be one of our big focus. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I call Brian Hoodle. Yeah, thank you, Kibir. Good morning to the panel, Kai. Uh, it, it, we'll talk about financial empowerment. I think in previous committee work, uh, looking at uh, the integration of IGBs, a repeated theme has been the lack of progress towards that financial empowerment of the IGBs. In fact, the MSG have set out the concerns in this area as well. And I think one of the things I noted there was focus should be on outcomes, not on which public body put the pound in in the first place. So can I ask, therefore, uh, what progress uh, has been made in achieving financial empowerment for the IGBs, or do individual parts continue to be influenced by where the money came from in the first instance? I wonder if I can ask Judith Proctor to ask, uh, address that question. Um, I, I... I think that um, we've made real progress in in this, and I, I was thinking when um, um, the, the question was being asked, you know, good examples of, of of just that financial empowerment. And I think the financial empowerment comes at the end of the sort of role of the IGB as the strategic planner in this and setting its direction and setting its ambitions out. Um, and if I give an example of that, not necessarily a, a COVID example of that. Some of the work that we've done in Edinburgh in terms of shifting the balance of care so that we're able to provide more services in the community. You know, the IGB set a direction to deliver a home first approach where we were very much focusing on 
supporting people in their, their own homes initially or um, if they were in hospital for a, a period of treatment, being able to get them home or to a homely setting as, as quickly as possible so that we were able to reduce our delays, but more importantly, uh, support and care for people in, in the right place the first time. Um, the, the, the board set that direction, set its ambition, and through that we were able to decommission um, acute care beds uh, within the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh and take that investment, take that funding, uh, and increase uh, um, our hospital at home service and our, our, our home first capability. Um, and that came from the IGB's sort of strategic planning independence, its role as a public body. And then our role as, as, as officers within the Health and Social Care Partnership, working very closely with colleagues in, in NHS Lothian to actually make that a reality, make sure that we had the right pathways in place, that individuals could go home and that we had the services there to, to respond to that. So I think the financial um, um, capability comes from having a, a good strategic plan and agreed a direction and then the good relationships and the way that we work with our partners in, in delivering that. And then ultimately, we've delivered a better outcome through that. You know, we've actually enabled better um, capacity with an acute. They can now use those beds for, for, for other necessary acute services. We've built capacity in the community. And as a result, we've improved outcomes for people and we've improved our performance. Thank you very much. Brian Biddle. Um, thank you, Convener. I'd be quite anxious to see, if, quite frankly, if, if, there, if there is any other response from across you know, the other IGBs, if, if that's the, the, the feeling that they have as well. But in, if I could ask the next question I have here um, around, uh, which is related to that question, on the whether the IGBs consider they have uh, sort of full control of the resources that are available to them, or as I said previously, does as uh, which partner provided the funding actually dictate to some extent where the money flow, where the money flows back to health and social care? Eddie Fraser. You know, the uh, ability to, to flex money across the, the system. Obviously, when money comes to us, there are big parts of the system that are quite um, fixed, if I can say that. So, so there are parts of the system, you know, in my budget, I spend about fifteen million pounds a year in care homes. I spend about twenty on, you know, care at home, etc. So large parts of that are going to roll over year after year. The same as the large parts of the budget within my health budget that will roll over my community nursing, you know, my health visitors year after year. Where we are seeing an ability is we've been able to do things a bit differently and therefore free up money. And when we've been able to free up money, that's when we've been able to move it around. So we've been able to move more money, irrespective of where it came from, across to intermediate care. We've been able to move some more money towards the front door of our social care services, which means we spend less there. And some of that money has been health money, so bringing allied health professions across to the front door services. So I would say where we show real successes is at the interface between the health and the care services. There are still large core services that work out there that are big parts of the budget that we can't move and likely shouldn't move because they're really good services. But how we do things differently is the area that I'm starting to see that works uh, really well. The areas that are more difficult, I would say, is if, you know, and the real point saying is we work in a system in a scenario where there's an underlying, you know, like deficit budget. So it's hard at times to, to move, other than very clear business cases that show that how do you move money that actually costs less for a better outcome for patients, and that's some of the work that we continually look at and do. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. I was just looking at the, the financial data for 2019-20. Uh, if I could go to, to speak to, to Eddie again here, I notice uh, the unusual. Uh, Words here about underspend uh, for East Ayrshire of 2.4 million. I wonder if you can maybe comment on that underspend, Eddie, and, and where you see that uh, being allocated. Eddie Fraser. Okay, so some of the underspend, you know, what, what we did with that is a few years ago, because we had an overspend in our, in our children's services, the council gave us a, a loan uh, at that time, so we're repaying some of the, the loan back uh, to, to the council. Uh, and that's again within the integration scheme of how that that should uh, work. We're also then investing, you know, money as we go forward in our, our care at home services and our intermediate care services. Uh, and and again, the areas that I said that's what we're freed up to do. The areas that we can do that. One of the other real areas of focus and areas of challenge for us 
is around our understanding of the challenges around mental health and around addiction. And therefore, what we're able to do is, you know, we've actually created another service around, you know, like mental health and recovery, and you know, make sure that we focus on that. It's a real issue for us, and that's an ability of an IGIB to work together to actually focus on that. So it's about how we take our money and invest it towards the areas that we know that are challenges for us. Brian Mitchell. Thank you. Um, and the, the evidence session the 11th of August in 2020. That was highlighted to committee the issues around Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partners' financial stability. And, and when the Scottish Government responded, they, know, they said it would they continue to work closely with the Edinburgh IGB to understand their uh, financial position and provide necessary support where, where it is needed. So, can I, can I ask then what ongoing support is being uh, provided by the Scottish Government? In respect of achieving uh, financial stability in Edinburgh, and, and will how will that financial balance? How was that financial balance achieved in 2019-20? Judith Proctor. And so um, we we did um, achieve balance last year. We set out a, a significant savings program, uh, which we delivered. In fact, we we, we over delivered the savings program that we had set out la last year. Um, but we did have to achieve balance in, in the year using also some reserves and one-offs within the, the health and within the IGB Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, I would add that that's the first time that the IGB in Edinburgh has actually um, uh, achieved balance in its budget under its own steam uh, with the, the funding allocated to it in previous years. And think, in fact, in every previous year um, before then, there's been additional funding come in at the year end from from our partners. So, so, so that was progress. Um, there, I think we are very cognisant and aware of the, the the challenges of our financial position. Our opening position this year was a, a 23 million pound gap, and again, we have uh, with the board agreed a, a savings programme that addresses that over the the short, medium, and longer term. We really recognise as a board that the True financial sustainability comes not from year-on-year -year savings plans, but actually in setting out a strategic uh, change programme and a strategic plan that um, creates a, a right-size organisation that delivers services in a, in a sustainable way. So that's the approach that we're taking with the board, and we're, we're in the process with our board of developing that uh, that longer-term. Uh, financial strategy. So uh, we go into this year with an agreed budget, with agreed savings program, which, uh, when achieved, uh, will deliver savings. Uh, will again deliver uh, a balanced position uh, towards the, the end of this year. It's going to be a significant challenge to do, uh, but we have got our plans in place and we've got the governance around that. In relation to the support from Scottish Government, we worked with them um, over COVID. They supported uh, through the work with uh, PwC. Uh, some work with us on provider sustainability. We have a, a, a large number of providers that we work with in, in care at home in, in the city, uh, and we really wanted to work on how best we coordinate that and how best we uh, spend our, our commissioning uh, funding as a partnership, in, in, in part to help us achieve better outcomes for people, but also that, that financial sustainability over a large part of our budget, which is uh, the services that we purchase for, for individuals for packages of care. Um, that, that piece of work with Scottish Government has come to an end, uh, and the support that we work with with Scottish Government is um, just ensuring that we are in close contact with them uh, on our, our position. But in terms of financial and practical input, that has come to an end with the end of the work that we did with PwC. Brian Whittle. Thank you. Finally, uh, Kavina, if I could say, ask uh, Dundee, uh, they had an overspend in 2019-20 of uh, £5.3 million. Pounds. I wonder whether uh, in the next upcoming financial year uh, that that balance, uh, that the budget might be balanced. Vicky Irons. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, certainly, we're making progress this year in terms of the financial balance of the IGB and uh, putting in lots of plans in terms of developing more sustainable responses across um, all service areas. The major pressure, certainly for last year, uh, came largely in terms of responding to demand for social care. So clearly, um, the additional resources that I mentioned earlier uh, that have been required in response to COVID uh, will exacerbate some of those pressures, particularly in, in responding to some of the issues which Eddie also highlighted in terms of uh, mental health services, but also responding to some of the Key service changes we need to make as a result of the Dundee Drugs Commission will be 
really key within the city. Uh, but we are certainly making progress um, in terms of our financial position um, and working with uh, evidence, I guess, from lots of other areas in terms of which aspects of service need to go through a, a level of reform to be able to get us into a more sustainable position. Um, I recently joined Dundee Health and Social Care Partnership in February. I was previously the Chief Officer for Angus. Um, and so it's very clear to me that the demands, certainly in a city environment in Dundee, are very different um, from the previous area which I had accountability for. So it does need some time to be able to work through the responses and to work through uh, the financial settlement that we need to agree with both the local authority and the NHS board to be able to respond to um, the pattern of demand which we're now seeing. Thank you very much. I now call David Collins. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Has there been an estimate of the cost to clear the backlog and return to pre-COVID levels of activity and performance? And what estimates have been included in your plans? Who would like to uh, have a go at that one? Uh, Eddie Fraser. So when I you know, earlier indicated that I thought it would cost us an additional uh, nine million pounds, you know, in terms of COVID, that's us projecting you know, for for the whole year in terms of the immediate costs and you know the the, the pressures, it does net off because there's been savings in other places to to about uh, six million pounds. But much of this is dependent on our model going forward. There there have been some you know the, the public have reacted a bit differently you know than maybe we would have anticipated. So so some of the public who are getting some of our lower level services, I think, are essential preventative services. They've been quite frightened to take some of these services and they've actually backed off some, some services. So I think one of the things we need to look at is to make sure that we, we not only take into account, if I can call them, the, 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 the health part of the support we give, but also the social part of the support we give. I think that's really essential and that's where we're working jointly with, with council. So it won't just be about funding in relation to you know IGIBs. It's about how that funding then flows through to some of our social care, you know, in our community, you know, uh, services, uh, their relationships there. How do we get back to lunch clubs? How do we get back to people actually engaging together in the type of social settings that's, that's a massive preventative service? So I, I, I can't give you just an, an exact answer for this because this is about how we change what we, we do. So I think we could go forward and we could provide likely, you know, Separate from COVID, within the budget, you know, a clinical service, but it's not the social care service that I know this committee is also looking at in a separate thing about what's the meaning, the, you know, of social care services and the value of the social care services as well. And I think that's where we need to get the balance of understanding, you know, what we can provide eh, and what is that, you know, preventative, inclusive provision that we want to to provide. So. Uh, the, 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 the cost of things depends what you know our ambition is, and you know we're very ambitious to be able to do that. So we spend more money on that preventative social inclusion end, and people live you know that they healthier lives and don't need as much of the clinical side of it for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So um, I guess it's important to distinguish um, um, in, in terms of the use of the word uh, backlog is that most of the activity um, that is delegated to the authority of, of the IGBs um, has really continued throughout, throughout the pandemic, with, with a few um, small exceptions, and I can come on to that. So we haven't, in the same way, potentially, that the acute sector has paused some of the elective activity, um, got a huge backlog in terms of responding to people's care needs. What we have done is responded to people's care needs, but certainly in, in some circumstances provided that in a different way. There is one area in particular that, that is a cause of concern at the moment, and that's um, the additional demands that have been placed on carers, particularly carers who uh, were looking after people with very complex conditions and were initially in the shielding category. Um, some of those did choose to pause some of their packages of care. Uh, to prevent additional people from coming into their home and exposing uh, the members of their family to additional risk. Um, so, um, and again, at that point, we didn't really know what length of time that we were all dealing with. Uh, so, we're now in a position where we're going to have to 
uh, look at all of those needs individually and assess how we can safely start to reprovide some of that level of support. And indeed, that's already happening. The other unknown entity here is uh, what we call the, the bubble, if you like, of, of post-COVID activity. And we are starting to see a lot of um, additional demand on our services now that's not COVID related. Um, some people describe it as deferred activity, uh, but these are people who are now presenting in the system who need our care, uh, assessment, treatment and support, um, but have been delaying that for fear of, of, of basically exposing themselves to risk by entering into our health and social care systems. So we do, again, we don't have a figure on that yet, um, but, but many of the cases we're now seeing are more complex and therefore will, will result in an increase in costs. But just to reiterate Eddie's point, in terms of remobilisation, um, uh, we do have each of the partnerships has a figure in terms of what that will cost, and we can provide that level of detail if it's of interest. Thanks very much. I'm sure it will be uh, indeed of interest. Uh, Judith Proctor. Yes, it, it was very briefly. I'm, I, I'm aware of the committee's time to just endorse my, my colleague's comments and, 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 and add that one of the other elements in this that I think we're all very uh, aware of um, is about the increase in the, the burden of, of poor mental health resulting from COVID lockdown anxiety and so on. And we are beginning to see some of that. And again, that's in the kind of unknown categories from our, our, our mobilisation and remobilisation plans. But we are anticipating those increasing demands in our services. Thank you very much. David Thomas. And my final question, convener, and I probably know answer this from all the panel members, but on balance over a whole financial year, would you expect additional costs from COVID-19 to be offset by reductions in expenditure elsewhere? I think we heard from Eddie numbers of nine million and six million. I, 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 can I can I ask Vicky and, and Judith briefly to comment on on that question, Vicky Ireland? And again, uh, our additional costs do sit at 16 million, so I'm afraid I can't see that being offset, offset by reductions in expenditure, you know, across the public sector elsewhere. Um, we're also in a position where, um, you know, many other parts of the public sector are um, uh, experiencing loss of income, you know, across a range of different service areas. So um, I can't see that being entirely offset. So again, we are dependent on. The additional support um, that was uh, outlined at the beginning of the pandemic from the Scottish Government, I think, to get us through this point, um, and then uh, as a as a you know collaborative leadership exercise, I guess um, you know public sector needs to really understand um, beyond the lessons learned reports that have already been um, commissioned uh, what it takes to provide a sustainable service uh, post COVID. And to do that, I think we all need to do an integrated piece and a, and a fresh strategic needs assessment um, to be able to use uh, the resources that we have to the best of our ability. Thank you very much. Judith Parker. It would be the same. Our, our COVID costs are estimated around 32 million for, for City of Edinburgh, uh, and that won't be offset by a, a reduction in activity elsewhere. Uh, and as Vicky said, we are also uh, losing income. Uh, at the same time, so I, I don't see that being offset by a reduction in activity. Thank you very much. Now, call George Adam. Thank you, convener, and good morning to everyone in the panel. I, I'd like to ask a question, similar to a question I asked uh, of NHS Ayrshire Man last week. The pandemic and the, the lockdown that follow, uh, followed it appear to have resulted. And a number of innovations in the way you work. Now, you've already mentioned some of that today as well, but NHS Ayrshire Marne said last week that the pandemic itself quickened this. And uh, we've actually got some information from Falkirk IGB, who, in the, when they replied to the committee's survey, they said in the actual quote, is, it is acknowledged that COVID-19 presents a unique opportunity to accelerate plans to shift the balance of care in light of the available capacity across the health and social care system. Now, can I ask my first question, which would be, in your experience and in your, uh, uh, and in your IGB, is this the actual case? Has this happened with you guys? Eddie Fraser. 
Yeah, and it's, it's nice of my colleagues for your narrative to reflect some of the work that we have done earlier. Um, so, so, so yes, you know, we were very involved in that interface. So setting up, and we spoke about time before. So that COVID hub, the you know that that we set up, we we done that within a fortnight, and you know bringing in at that time we had you know a number of the pra GP practices shut, and so we were able to bring GPs in. We were able to set up tents for people coming through and really deliver an innovation. But really, the core of that was about setting up the different communications right across the whole system, and it's that communication I think I said earlier that we cannot lose. It's you know been able to for us to take things and to be able to see how we can do things differently, um, you know, and you know make sure that patients get it's, it's access. It's about patients getting good access to service, getting early access to services, and they're the types of things that I think that we need to make sure that that we cannot lose the, the communication right across the system. You know, as we move forward into this winter around the redesign of urgent care, will largely be based on the things that we've learned over the last number of months. And again, if we can see that divert and sizable number of people to a place where they get you know care quickly. Whether that be pharmacy first, whether it be at a GP practice, whether it be advice directly from you know one of our hubs, but saving people going and waiting for four hours in an emergency department to get seen by someone for ten minutes. So this is not for me about protecting the emergency department. This is for me about making sure people get the right care in the right place. And I think they are the things that we've learned, and we'll be, we, you know, we need to take forward and make sure we continue to build on that. And that is the process of redesign of urgent care that we're looking at just now to do that right across the system. Georgia. Yes, that, that's quite interesting, Eddie, what you've said because Ayrshire and Allen, when they came last week, NHS, they they more or less said that the pandemic itself had uh, quickened us and had made had made it actually broken down the barriers and. My question to them, and it might be a frustration you feel, Eddie, but my, my question to them was, why did it take a worldwide pandemic to actually break down these barriers? Eddie Fraser again. Suppose we all get into this thing about you know, chicken and egg. Who is going to invest first to save later? Uh, and What this did was across, but in Ayrshire and Aaron, we are essentially working across you know, at least seven public bodies. We've got the three councils, the three IGIBs, and, and the health board. And what we were able to do is just sit down and agree. You know, so it, it was under my team that we put together the COVID hub, etc. We just agreed. We put a head of service there and said, "Do it." You know, and some of that it was helped. I've got to say, by direction from Scottish government that freed us up to say we were able to just do that. So it it, it did take. That freeing up, if I can call it that, that feeling that 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 joint purpose, that necessity to to drive forward, that and that was built again on that level of trust around funding. That funding would come to to pay for all this, and we drove forward, and it's been hugely successful in terms of what we've been able to deliver. Not only doing that, but we've delivered beside that on testing. We're, you know, we hopefully will deliver beside that as we go forward in flu immunisation. We'll deliver on it in terms of COVID Im immunisation, hopefully. Um, and these things have all been driven together out of that core trust at the start that we can do things right across the whole system. Thank you very okay. much. My final question would be to all of you: would be basically, uh, how these uh, new innovative ways of working? Uh, how do you feel that once we move forward and things go back to whatever is the new normal now? How how do you feel? That uh, you'll be able to retain them and keep these relationships going, and, and ensuring that you're still delivering in a very similar manner to what Eddie's already said. Uh, Ricky Atkins. Well, um, my view would be that I hope that everybody has has learnt the value of that um, level of collective activity and 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 seen the outcomes that are possible when people do work together. Um, in an integrated way, uh, so I, I think it's not, you know, a case of let's wait and see whether we're able to retain some of that. I think it has to be retained, um, and I think, um, uh, you know, Eddie's reflections on just how prepared everybody was to step in and do the right thing has been mirrored across um, all the communities of, of Scotland, and, and certainly uh, within Tayside, 
you know, I think somebody mentioned the word pace earlier. Um, I was personally quite taken aback at just how quickly new arrangements fell into place, just how quickly all of the barriers that we've experienced before certainly were, were no longer barriers, um, and everybody was prepared to, to play a part wherever they could. And I think that extends beyond the health and social care family. That extends to our local resilience partners as well, who, you know, even with very practical issues, helped us put um, the, the COVID hubs in place literally over the space of a weekend uh, within days of, of the pandemic being um, confirmed. So I think uh, surely our collective experience uh, should pave the way for us wanting to retain that level of integrated working. I think there is potentially one risk, and the risk is uh, uh, in terms of remobilisation and, um, I guess, the pressure that will be put on the individual partners who make up the partnership to resume activity um, that was in place before the pandemic. And that may, um, in an unintended way, encourage some partners to revert back to ways of working that we had in place before. But I think we've put so much work into um, you know, an integrated response, particularly through the local resilience partnerships, that you know, we'll, we're mindful of that risk and hopefully we won't return to uh, recreate some of those barriers that were present. Judith Proctor. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think we, um, we we don't wait and see. I think we're intentional about what it is that we're we're keeping, and we 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 put that in place. I think we also need to be mindful in that of of the view of of people and communities, uh, and make sure that we're capturing that. So you, you know, the use of near me technology. I mean, I I've been around health and social care for a, an awful long time. And it seems like for an awful lot of that time, we've been talking about moving to things like near me video conferencing. Um, we did that in a matter of weeks. It, it's been an incredible pace of change. Uh, and I think we need to know and be able to demonstrate that for the people that are using that, that are experiencing the delivery of their health and social care service through that, that it is as good or indeed better. So there's that aspect of it, of it too. Um, but I think we need to say these things are, are things that we must keep. So therefore, let's find ways to do that. Let's invest in that. Let's think about how we we, we, we shift our, our, our way of working to do that. So I think for me, it's that twin process of lessons learned, looking at the evidence and really understanding that the experience for people and outcomes for people are as good um, or indeed better through those new ways of working that we need to, 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 to be mindful of. Thank you very much. I now call my colleague Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Judith and and uh, Eddie and uh, Vicky. Thanks very much. It's been interesting to hear the responses so far. And just to pick up on uh, uh, George Adam's questions about innovation is interesting, and the response about near me. I'm interested in kind of looking at where that fits in with shifting the balance of care and set aside budgets. Um, I've asked questions about set aside budgets in the past. And how do we move care from acute care and into community? Because we know that integration authorities are really important to move care into the community from acute care. I'm aware that some of the innovative models that have been picked up in Dufres and Galloway have been looking at using uh, what's called home teams to go out and uh, and help support people who are in the community. And uh, I'm interested to hear from you whether you think that uh, changes from the pandemic and pandemic planning um, can expect to see a complete long-term shift in the balance of care between hospital and community care. Suppose that would be a question for you for you all, really. Start with Eddie Fraser. So, so I think you know, like yes, because when before when we spoke spoke about how do we maintain things, I think one of the the, the groups of people that are really important in this is the clinicians. So for clinicians, both acute and in primary, actually see things can be done differently and, and better. Then that helps us with that, you know, like buy-in eh, in terms of how we change the services. So, so part of what we are doing, I, I can give one example around respiratory care, is actually seeing how we can pull a lot of that work down into the community from hospitals. So as people are, you know, get that support in their locality rather than transferring to our two uh, acute hospitals. So I think, you know, everyone in principle agrees with people getting care as close to home as possible. 
But just now, I think what has been evidenced is that that can happen. And it's that evidence of that being able to happen is what we need to maintain. You know, the, the ability of not only our, you know, acute clinicians, but also most of our GP practices are now looking at how do people access the GP practice? You know, how do you do that differently? So again, you know, we've went to, you know, high levels of telephone contact and people are happy to get that if they're getting it on the day. You know, but there's still that 30 to 40 percent who need to come in and see the GP and that's fine. So we're seeing a real change in how things are happening. And it just now, certainly in my area, we've been able to see some shift of money from hospital to community. But that's been around the things that's been within the IGIB's control. So it's been around our community hospitals and how I changed that. You know, to date, you know, and although we have a programme of caring for Ayrshire that is a longer term vision, it's been hard up till this time to actually see a shift of, of any of the acute budget eh, across. I think just looking at bed nights as well is a very crude measure at times when people have used it that. It's about the totality of the hospital. How do we look at outpatients? You know, how do we look at you know the, the ED? How do we look at a range of other care in terms of that that shift? So there's been success, but some of that success to date has been within things that we are in our control rather than being across the whole system for me. It is proper. I would use a, a, again the example that I, I mentioned earlier. We, we've had some success in relation to you know. To, Closing or decommissioning uh, services in acute wards. We, we've closed two wards so far: one uh -huh. at the Western General, one at the Royal Infirmary. Uh, and with the investment that uh, that sits in the set aside, have invested in community services for people that have enabled us to support people at home and in a homely setting. So that investment has been around allied health professionals, that sort of reablement, re uh, rehabilitation capacity in the community and in community teams to, to do that. Um, one of the, 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 the rapid uh, developments that we saw over COVID was something that was already in our plans, and we've done a couple of, of test events with Home First as an approach, uh, which is very much around, as I, as I say, how do we support people to, to be at home? The hospital at home, where we're able to do that to prevent an admission to, to hospital if we can, with the clinical wraparound, with the care wraparound, and then at the other end, where an individual has had to be in hospital, how do we support them? Early conversations, working to a discharge date, not working from a delayed date when people are already delayed in the system, and making sure that we've got the flow through from that conversation into to good, robust community services. So, so some of those things um, we've been able to do. Some of them, is, as, as Eddie says, are, are were in our gift because they are our resources. But we've, we've worked very hard with NHS Lothian to, to realise a shift in investment. Small amounts at this moment in time, but you know they, they, they do matter, and I think they do signal a, a possible way ahead. And again, echoing Eddie's comments, they show us. Um, as organisations, and they show us as professionals and clinicians that it is possible to do that, and to do that safely for people, and to achieve you know, better outcomes for them, and, and, and care in their own homes wherever we're able to do it. The key arguments. Thank you. So, um, just to add to both of those uh, series of comments, um, I think when it comes to large hospital set aside, um, even even prior to the pandemic, we're starting to see some signs of movement. In terms of uh, the level of financial resource uh, that was indicated as part of our financial settlement for this year, but I think it really goes beyond large hospital set aside. Uh, I would agree with comments made by my colleagues about this is essentially about how we do things, and it's how um, our frontline practitioners practice. Um, and I think uh, if I can share with you the first principle of our remobilisation plan. Um, from Dundee IGB, and that is that people will only attend buildings for um, assessment, treatment, and care where there is no alternative available. Um, and that's purely because we're still in the period of risk that we are about um, the risks associated with people being in enclosed spaces. But really, that's an indication of where we should be striving for in terms of our, our, our future intent, um, in terms of the provision of care. And uh, whereas previously, I think we've had really, really robust relationships with uh, a bunch of uh, specialties in the acute sector who are aligned to the IGB, such as our uh, medicine for the elderly consultants um, and psychiatrists and, and a range of other respiratory uh, clinicians, uh, we are now seeing a growing number of, of uh, clinicians who provide very specialist support 
now essentially uh, providing particularly assessment, but assessment and care in a community setting. Uh, we've mentioned near me, but some of the technology isn't always required and, and lots of consultants are now um, providing advice, doing initial assessments by telephone, for instance, and have, adop have adapted really, really well. So we must, we simply have to retain that and, and I, it would be um, a real shame if we reverted back to a system which is uh, really quite heavily weighted and dependent on, on buildings and infrastructure to provide the level of care uh, that we can provide, particularly as Eddie's highlighted, where we've experienced a difference over the last few months. And for many people, access has actually been improved. It's very different to what they've experienced before, but many people are able to get advice on the day, um, not only through their general practice, through a range of other community professionals, um, and, and indeed, in some cases, right through to the specialist who's, uh, who, who you're usually in quite a long queue to see um, in the acute sector. So we really must retain that. Um, and I think rather than use all of our energy trying to negotiate you know, a better set aside deal, I think we now need to um, bank, if you like, the credit that Eddie's alluded to in terms of uh, the difference that clinicians have seen in practicing in this way. And we need to build on that for the future. Very much, Emma Harper. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, previously at committee, we heard that set aside budget was held by the NHS boards or controlled by the boards when actually um, set aside is supposed to be used for for other purposes. So, and because of the pandemic, you're describing um, things like say respiratory pulmonary rehabilitation is now a uh, virtual. Be done virtually. We've got issues with cardiac or cardiovascular rehabilitation, which would be done more in the community as well. And so, I'm interested to hear whether there's a, going to be an impact on the set aside budget, or do we really just need to look at a completely separate way of using that um, budget uh, and basically directing it completely for community-based support programs to deal with like post. COVID symptoms like is being described, long COVID. So I'm wondering, so has there been any impact on the set aside budget? And uh, do you think the set aside is working um, effectively or has coronavirus and the pandemic meant that we need to do something different with it? Eddie Fraser. Just as you know, before um, COVID, we had been working very closely with Scottish Government across the partnerships about how we use, and you used the word yourself there, eh, directions. So how do we jointly with colleagues get up and say we are going to change something? And this is the impact in terms of strategy, in terms of service, in terms of finance. So for instance, we, we have a new pulmonary rehab team. And interestingly, the funding for that came out the prescribing budget. You know, we were able to do things so differently there that we made significant savings. Some of that went to savings, but the rest of it went to fund a pulmonary rehab team. And that, that use of very deliberate directions, you know, from IGIBs to both the health board and the council is a way forward. And so it's not just around the set aside budget. The set aside budget is important, but in my total budget, the set aside budget is only about ten percent of my budget. And you know, some of that will always require unscheduled care within you know the hospital. So the actual free amount of that is even less. The important thing for me is that we do these directions. That's a clear saying: we want to change something. This is what we want to change, and why. Here's the service implications, and therefore here's the financial implication of that. So, so the, the examples you give are great examples, and they are the things you know around respiratory, cardiology, diabetes. The things that we think can likely be done more in a um, community setting, but not always based on. Often uh, we base this set aside on bed nights, and a lot of this won't be about bed nights. It will be about you know how we look at you know our outpatient appointments and the range of other interventions that we have there. So I do think COVID has helped us to show that we can do that differently. And again, it's working with all our clinicians to make sure we deliver that. I don't know if either Judith or Vicky wants to add anything on the area of set aside. Um, uh, uh, Judith, Judith Proctor. The focus is 
Sorry. Yes, I, I would agree with Eddie. I think the focus is on what it is that you want to do and what you want to change, and then the budget should f follow from that. But it's setting out the, in the intention through your strategic direction and, and a, a, an actual direction from the IGB. So I absolutely agree with that. Focus needs to be on what it is that we're trying to do, not the budget itself per se. Vicky Adams. Uh, yeah, just to mirror those comments, um, uh, mirroring those comments, I think uh, it's it's fair to say that the original intent set aside has maybe felt a little bit clunky. I can't think of a better way of describing that um, over over the duration of the last five years. Um, and, and I don't think it's the only lever for change that we have. Um, it's also um, only, if you like, a slice of the acute activity that we, we want to tackle in a different way and in an integrated way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm far more interested now in having discussions about the total resource. I'm not going to use the word total budget because I, I think we see change through people. But if we can have a really upfront um, adult conversation about the total resource, where that needs to be, how we can genuinely shift that balance of care into community after the experience we've all just lived through, then I think that's where we need to focus our attentions um, rather than um, trying to increase the figure um, that is nominally indicated in our set-aside budget. Thank you very much. Emma. Thank you. Just a final question, convener. Um, um, Vicky talked about um, refocusing, for instance, instead and, or re-resourcing. So we've seen a lot of redeployment of people working from home and um, changing the ways of working. So we'll have people that were normally based in acute care that are now maybe working in a more community-focused way. So um, how has that been able to demonstrate that uh, ultimately that's a saving on bed nights, for instance, if we're keeping people out of hospital by supporting them in the community. And I'm just wondering how adaptable has the, the workforce been to this relocation of service or refocus of providing service in a community type way? Vicky Adams. Um, so, from my experience, um, certainly uh, the answer to the, the question around adaptability is, is that we've seen uh, huge efforts from um, those who've been redeployed from um, an NHS background and also local authority background into new roles in community settings. Some of those new roles were um, aligned to new services which we needed to put in place. Um, I think colleagues have mentioned earlier on. Um, again, at PACE, we had to set up community testing functions and testing uh, facilities, um, which in, in Tayside and Dundee certainly began with a very small number of people and grew um, very, very rapidly to need quite a lot of the workforce redeployed and to have the skills to do testing um, to, to keep up with the level of demand that we had. And a whole series of other services have had to be delivered in an entirely different way. Um, and in people's own homes um, that you would expect to see normally in an inpatient setting. So lots of the workforce, if you like, um, were redeployed to be able to support that. I think, I think it's fair to say that as we're moving into the recovery phase now, lots of people are being, if you like, called back to their substantive posts because they, they need to be part of a recovery period for the, for the services affected. So there is uh, quite a bridge for us to be, that, that needs to be formed here to ensure that for the new roles that we did commission and bring into the community, we need to identify those which we actually need to keep. You know, there, there are new services which have formed throughout the pandemic, and there are some of those services will feature in the longer term. They're, they're not just a, an immediate response to, to demand. So we need to understand what those new services are, and we then need to um, have the conversations across the agencies to ensure that we retain those skills and those people in those roles. But um, it's actually quite a significant exercise for us to undertake. Judith Barber. I, I think we saw extraordinary flexibility and agility from our workforce. And uh, in our own lessons learnt capture in in Edinburgh, the lessons learnt piece of work that we did, you know, from from those that that wrote back to us, one of the things that many in our workforce really valued was just their ability to be flat, flexible, um, and the the the, the different. Um, areas of work that they were able to, to undertake and just the, the empowerment that came with that. 
And I think that's something that we definitely need to capture, you know, just being able to to work flexibly with our workforce, you know, obviously uh, within their terms and conditions and being fair and supporting them and, and supporting their, their, their health and well-being. But people enjoyed that feeling of flexibility and empowerment in that. And just your, your point in terms of being able to, to measure some of the, the, the difference that this has made, we certainly saw through through some of the approaches that we took uh, uh, as much as a 63% reduction in bed nights lost to delays over this period of time, just by us being able to work differently to support people in communities and support them at home. Uh, I think we absolutely must capture that hard data as well in terms of the difference that we're making, because if it worked in COVID, it will work in in winter. It will work in a pressure that's that's under uh, sorry in a system that's under pressure. And so therefore, we we must do that. And um, it's the right thing to do to be supporting people at home. I think Vicky said it earlier on. People are really keen now to to experience as much of their care and support as as possible in their community and in their homes. So we we need to to demonstrate from you know people's experience the hard data as well as what our staff are telling us that that is possible to do and to do well. Thank you very much, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. I have uh, a series of questions about delayed discharge. Uh, in their lessons learned report, the Scottish Government and Health and Social Care Scotland say the causes of delay are, and I quote, compounded by deep-rooted behaviour issues and bad became the norm. Do you agree? I wonder if I could ask perhaps Judith Proctor to start off. Um, it's quite a statement that isn't it bad became the norm because I, I I don't believe that anybody in our system whichever professional role that you're undertaking comes in to do their job and to, to not do it well everybody is focused on what they think is the the right thing to do uh, for individuals I think one of the issues that we see with with with, with delays is that we can just be a little bit too um, focused on our, our our own lens on that and not really thinking through you know what does the individual here need and, and and what are they capable of I think there's also something in relation to you know what you know uh, and I think that 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 quote from the lessons uh, learnt report possibly reflect um, a view where some partnerships and some of us see the decision being made on where an individual goes post hospital being made by clinicians and professionals who are not familiar with what we deliver in social care and what we deliver in the community and the capability of that. Now, I don't know if you would typify that as bad or typify that as, you know, you, you can't know what, what you don't know and you don't have experience of. And our whole approach to, to Home First, and it's not unique to Edinburgh, they, they're doing it, I mean, particularly Tayside, Dundee, where, where my colleague Vicky Irons is, is chief officer. You know, these are, are well-developed programmes of work where individuals who know the community and know the capability in the community uh, work with the individual in hospital and, and they pull them from hospital into the community. Um, so I think if, if my memory serves, that's what the, the, the comment in the, the lessons learned report means. Um, those behaviours in and of themselves are not meant to be bad, but I, I think they do reflect where you stand in the system, uh, what you know. Uh, and your own professional experience, and that's the bit that we need to shift. We make, need to make the norm. You know, it's people that work in the community that that work with the individual and their family and their community to help decide how that individual is there then supported in the community. David Stewart. Um, thank you. If I move on to another question, how were additional funds used to reduce delayed discharge in your respective areas? Perhaps start with Vicky Irons. Thank you. So um, our additional funds uh, weren't necessarily uh, targeted to reducing our delayed discharge uh, figures within Dundee. We, we were in um, a, a good starting position, I think, to reflect on um, my colleague Judith's um, comments there in terms of our ways of working. Um, uh, with the exception of potentially funding some of our more complex care packages. Um, so we had a relatively small number of patients in delay at the beginning of the process, um, and each of the assessments in terms of movement of any of those patients was done on an individual basis with our uh, multidisciplinary team. Um, so we weren't required, if you like, to deploy huge additional resource into that area with the exception of those with some more of the complex care packages. And that was really um, just to ensure that we had 
the resource available to provide every aspect of, of care that had already been um, assessed in terms of the needs of those individuals. Um, I think uh, where we have used, I'm not sure if this was part of the question, but where we have used the additional resource is in uh, increasing demands for care at home. Um, those have come quite naturally. Um, and uh, we've also deployed a lot of extra resource into uh, rehabilitation services. And again, that links back to previous comments about still the unknown entity in terms of potential tail of COVID um, in, in, and the recovery of a number of the uh, people who uh, contracted the virus in the early stages. Thank you, Fraser. From a very strong place in terms of delayed discharges, you know, we've not had a delayed discharge breach with any of for, for many, you know, years. They actually the couple that we've had have been out with the, the, the board area. Um so we have an embedded, you know, a social work team, you know, within, you know, the hospital that works very closely with the wards and including mental health officers to draw people uh, out. What we did do uh, was we anticipated that there may be issues about being able to deliver um social care in the community. You know, like during COVID, and so people who would normally be discharged, we thought there might be problems with that. So we did commission some extra social care, you know, like capacity for us to be able to make sure that we we drew that down. So it was almost about preventing people becoming delayed discharges rather than actually having to de deal with uh, delayed discharges uh, as such. That the whole, you know, like hospital at home, you know, model or intermediate care models are discussing and across these are slightly different things, but they are the discussions about how do we make sure that that expertise is available in the community, and and right in the very front page of that lessons learned, uh, you know, that there's a quote and it's a quote we use all the time. This is not about delayed discharge. This is about transfer of care. People need to be confident that the care of a person has been transferred from a hospital to a different services. They are not falling off a cliff. You know, that's a safe transfer of care that we should be talking about. And I think that, you know, people the attitudes that were spoken about earlier, uh, about, you know, why people think that somebody, you know, has to go into a, a care home when they don't really know what it is. We need to make sure that we give confidence that there are good community resources that people can transfer the care to without having to rely on, you know, getting to a care home if that's not absolutely necessary. And sometimes it will be. Thank you. And David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Camille. My, my final question. Um, as the panel will know, there was a sharp fall in delayed discharge between February and March. But the Scottish figures are on the rise again. Can we sustain the fall, and can the problem be eliminated altogether? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we have witnessed um, um, an increase, certainly over the last fortnight, within our local partnership in terms of those numbers. So, um, I believe we can sustain. Um, uh, performance in relation to delayed discharges, but it may be links to the journey of the individual prior to admission. Um, and I would hope that with all of the additional focus that there is now in a community setting, uh, we're, we're reducing the numbers of delayed discharges by also reducing those people who need to attend and be admitted to hospital setting in the first place. So um, we can sustain some of the success so far. I think what we've witnessed, particularly in the last couple of weeks, um, is in response to that bubble, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, and again, not necessarily a good description of, of, of what's occurring, but we are seeing a general increase in demand across the system now for people who are presenting with symptoms. Um, unfortunately, those people um, who may have had a deferred level of, of illness, if you like, um, are presenting um, and they're sicker. And potentially more frail uh, and with more complexity of need. So um, that will have an impact in terms of our ability to discharge people um, quickly um, and into the to the setting of choice. Uh, but we we literally uh, monitor our performance on a daily basis um, across the partnerships in Scotland. So as soon as we get an idea of what of what some of the key um, issues are or the key conditions are, I guess more than anything else. Will be responding to those to ensure that um, 
you know, we, we do make the most of the gains that we've seen throughout the pandemic in terms of our performance and that we don't, if you like, snap back into uh, the characteristics that you would have seen pre-COVID. Judith Proctor. Um, like others, we have seen an increase. I mean, we got to historically low levels of delayed discharge in, in Edinburgh, where we, we have struggled with this over over a number of years. Um, and that was down to the mobilisation plan, doing things differently. Also, of course, because our, our hospitals were focusing uh, almost entirely on, 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 on COVID. So we saw a, a significant change in activity. Uh, and those things together, uh, I think, certainly um, address the, the delayed di discharge position. Our numbers are, as others going up, we would want to sustain them around about where they are now, because until we do things um, very differently at scale, I don't think we can eliminate delayed discharge in, in, in Edinburgh. Uh, I think we're working very, very hard to make sure that we've got processes in place, as I say, our home first, where we have a team that works in our, our acute hospitals. It includes our mental health hospitals as well, for those people that are are delayed long term for, for very complex problems and um, working together there. We also need a sustainable community um, care service. And again, the fragility of the market, something we haven't touched upon, but obviously will be subject to the independent review. Right. That's a real issue for, for us. And we don't know the impact post COVID as providers come through this and sustainability payments are, are tapered off. Um, so there's there's many many factors that make delayed discharge a, a, a complex one to say that we can eliminate it. We would certainly be ambitious to because it's the wrong thing for people. Um, people are harmed by being delayed in hospital when they are ready to go home, and we really want to be able to get them home uh, as soon as possible. So uh, we are um, keen and working very hard to sustain it at the still historically low levels for Edinburgh, uh, and not see a return to some of the, the 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 high numbers that we we have had before. But I don't think we can eliminate before we see those significant large system right. sustainable changes that we're all trying to do through our strategic plans. And Amy Fraser. Um, so, so, so yes, we would intend to, to, to sustain, you know, the very low levels. You can never totally eliminate when we call it delayed discharges. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm meaning anyone who's delayed from the point of being able to be uh, discharged. I don't mean the, you know, the cut off at the two week period, because sometimes it takes time to make arrangements. And although we do the best we can to make the arrangements, you know, look before, you know, a person's ready for discharge. You know, this is about, you know, the, the human rights aspect of this as well about if a person chooses where they want to go, how do we make sure we get them there? Now we still do that very quickly, as I said. So it's not about becoming over the two weeks. But the numbers of people that will take between three days and you know fourteen days, there will be some that will be around that. You know, in terms of that, so it's about balancing the, the rights of people. First of all, the rights that they do not be harmed by left in a hospital when they, they don't need to be there, but also looking at their wider human rights and making sure that we engage with them and their family about the discharge arrangements. So it's not about any of these long delays. It's about short delays whenever possible and making sure we get people to the right place at the right care. Thank you very much. And that concludes our questions to witnesses in relation to pre-budget scrutiny. Can I thank Judith Proctor, Vicky Irons and Eddie Fraser for their evidence? Vicky Irons mentioned that there were uh, uh, figures in relation to uh, remobilisation that might be of interest to us and we'll certainly Look forward to receiving those, and, and uh, no doubt there will be one or two other items that we will come back to on. But can I thank the witnesses very much for your attendance and for your comprehensive answers this morning. Thank you. We now move on. The second item on the agenda is subordinate legislation, consideration of a made affirmative instrument. As in previous weeks, these regulations relate to coronavirus and international travel and are laid under Section 941, International Travel of the Public Health. Scotland Act 2008. They are made affirmative regulation uh, instruments. That means that uh, they are already in force, but they have to be approved by a resolution of the Parliament within uh, 28 days of the date in which they are made. Uh, and it is for the Health and Sport Committee to consider the instruments and report to Parliament accordingly. Uh, we will uh, hear in a moment from the Justice Secretary uh, in relation to these instruments. Uh, and once we have asked all our questions, we will have the 
strong debate on the motion uh, that he will propose. The instrument we're looking at today is the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Scotland Amendment Number 10 Regulations 2020. And I welcome to the committee Humza Yusuf, Ca uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, who is accompanied by Rachel Sunderland, the Deputy Director for Population, uh, uh, Population and Migration Division, Jamie McDougall, Deputy Director of the Test, Test and Protect Portfolio, and Anita Popplestone, Head of Police Complaints and Security. Um, I will uh, look to colleagues who may have questions, uh, and I draw the attention of colleagues to the letter uh, reply from Hamza Yusuf received uh, uh, on the 3rd of September, uh, following a previous appearance where he answered a number of questions. And I know Emma Harper had raised questions two weeks ago in relation to uh, ferry travel and passengers arriving in Scotland. And I wonder if M Emma Harper would like to follow up uh, on those questions. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It was just to comment on uh, the response regarding ferries and the, the detailed response in the letter uh, from the Cabinet Secretary. And also, I've checked on uh, one of the websites for one of the ferry companies between Ireland and Cairn Ryan, and they have really detailed information as well. So I wanted to just comment and say thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for his response uh, with the detail in his letter. Thank you very much. And I noted in relation to that that uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, note, noted that uh, passenger locator forms are completed by passengers arriving by ferry in Scotland and also uh, presumably in ports elsewhere in the United Kingdom for travel onward to Scotland. And I wonder, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you can indicate if, if the, the kind of detailed information which Emma Harper has referred to from the ferry operators uh, can also be made available by yourself to the committee. Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, uh, convener, to you uh, and all the committee members. Uh, forgive me for any of the background noise you may hear, as um, there's a bit of building work going on. Um, I am more than happy, of course, to provide uh, Emma Harper and the committee with detailed information that we have of passengers uh, arriving by ferry ports uh, into Scotland, that, that information uh, can be made available. We can get that from Transport Scotland uh, if, if, if you wish. We have information uh, around uh, entry into ports at Scotland. We can also, uh, where uh, possible, we can inquire about ports of entry um, uh, in terms of or, or UK ports of entry. I, I know there might be an interest in, for example, uh, the ports of Dover and, and Cali, and, and, and the number of passengers that travel from there. What, what I would say is, when it comes to those that are arriving in Scotland, regardless of whatever way, means, or method you choose to travel into Scotland, if on your passenger locator form your destination is Scotland, you end up in the cohort of data uh, that can be uh, and will be sampled by public health. Scotland. So, regardless of the way you travel in, by air, by sea, uh, by, by, by any other means, if your destination is Scotland, then you are very much part of the pool uh, that can be accessed and sampled by Public Health Scotland. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the instrument that is before us today is, of course, in relation to the addition of, of uh, a country to the exempt list. Uh, and uh, a number of regulations that you've brought before us have involved either adding or removing countries from that list. Now, when uh, we spoke to you a couple of weeks ago, one of the questions uh, that was asked uh, was the way in which these additions are brought forward to the attention of Parliament. And in re your response, you, you, you noted that wherever possible, we are trying to align with the other UK nations in relation, for example, to implementation dates and also uh, to those countries which are on the exemption list. However, I think it is fair to comment uh, that, that there remains uh, a, a misalignment, uh, at least uh, on a short-term basis, between different countries within the United Kingdom in that regard. And I wonder if you can give any indication of the ongoing work that you may be doing uh, to seek to achieve a position where the message to 
traveller into the travel industry from the four nations of the UK is as far as possible the same message uh, in terms of what the implications of quarantine requirements might be. Government Secretary. I think that is fair comment. Uh, I think there is uh, a degree of uh, alignment, of course, where we can, but clearly there's areas where, where, where there's not alignment. I, I, I do think it is important to stress, and I saw a, a good piece by it was the journalist Peter Smith on, 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 on ITN around actually why there shouldn't be too much confusion for travellers, because we had, uh, obviously, as you know, Convena uh, only too well, to, over 20 years of devolution. And so, therefore, the reasons why one part of the United Kingdom, one nation of the United Kingdom, might take uh, one decision may well be very understandably different to another part. So, if I gave you the example of, for example, the, the removal of Greece that we took uh, last week, uh, and I see that uh, other parts of the UK have removed some of the islands in terms of exemptions uh, to, to, to Greece, but when we, when we took that decision, it was very much based on the circumstances in Scotland. So the number of positive cases, and of course, can you aware of, of, of some of the rise in positive cases, the number of positive cases that were linked to international travel from Greece was giving us concern in a Scottish context. That may not be the same case for, for Northern Ireland. It may not be the case for Wales. It may not be the case for England. And therefore, completely understandably, uh, one nation in the United Kingdom, in this case Scotland, may well take a very different decision to, 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 to the others. To answer your question a bit more directly, uh, if I may, uh, you may have seen the announcement yesterday from Grant Sharp, Secretary of State for Transport in the United Kingdom government. Uh, he, he gave me a call just shortly before his statement to say that the JBC, the, the Joint Biosecurity Centre, will look to now see if they can bring forward data on a more regional approach. I know the committee has asked me previously whether or not we can look at that regional approach. So I've only seen the data for, for, for Greece that came in yesterday. Um, but my understanding is that the JBC will provide data on a number of islands, uh, and, and we can consider that on a regional basis, which again may help with alignment. But uh, we will try that the Four Nations alignment as best as we possibly can. But for very understandable reasons, um, you know, there may be you know, occasions when, when, when that alignment is just not possible. You, you did indeed, in uh, response to our letter, uh, say that you were uh, continuing to discuss with the other UK nations the adoption of a regional approach. Wales has been doing that for some time. The UK government in relation to England, as you say, made that announcement yesterday. Do you anticipate a similar announcement in relation to Scotland in the near future? I couldn't say until I've seen uh, the, the the real detail of of, of the data. Uh, Wales, I think, only took the regional approach uh, last week, and, and obviously it would be for the the, the Welsh uh, health minister to, um, to, to to be able to explain why why they took that decision in particular. Um, at the moment, this, e even if we have the data on regional um, variances of the transmission of the virus, what we'd have to have confidence about. And I think I, I did mention this in the previous um, committee appearance. We'd have to have real assurance around. The travel that happens between the mainland of a country and the islands, um, because we know that's that 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 can be where, where where a lot of the danger lies. But to answer your question, um, you know, I'll certainly look at the data um, where we can have an original approach that's effective. We'll look to do that, uh, but clearly uh, you'll understand, particularly the cases that we have in Scotland, the rise in cases we've seen in Scotland the last uh, few weeks. Uh, my my approach will still be a fairly cautious one. Thank you very much. I'm, I, I'm looking to colleagues, but for my own part, I have one more question before we move to the uh, next item of the agenda, which is the debate on the motion before us today. In our previous discussions and in correspondence, you said uh, that you were considering uh, the possibility of publishing on a weekly basis the Public Health Scotland statistics of those who have recently arrived from abroad who have developed symptoms uh, or who have tested positive. I wonder if you've yet come to a conclusion uh, in that consideration and what your plans are going forward. Cabinet Secretary. The conclusion uh, I've come to, uh, Convener, is that uh, I think we should absolutely publish the statistics. Uh, we are just finding a way to do that that will protect people's privacy because uh, a number of the positive cases that are linked to international travel are simply one person travelling from a country. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, with a very small number of flights in a week, 
uh, sometimes even just one flight in a week. Uh, there, there could be issues around identification of that individual, um, but they're, they're not insurmountable issues. We can absolutely work through that. So um, I, I, I will uh, give that. Uh, well, I'll be arguing that consideration, but I'll certainly speed up that consideration because um, you know my my uh, instinct and my my desire certainly is to make sure that that um, data is published and there should be uh, no uh, obstacle that we can't uh, overcome to, to, to publishing that. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing further on that uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, we now move, if there are no further questions from colleagues, we now move to agenda item three, which is the formal debate on the made affirmative SSI in which we have just taken evidence. I remind colleagues uh, that uh, we're, we are no longer in a question and answer mode, but uh, in a formal debate mode, uh, and equally officials may not uh, participate at this stage. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion S5M22521 in his own name, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, I'm, I'm happy to waive any rights to speak uh, to, 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 to the motion. Uh, I think uh, uh, colleagues are aware uh, of the detail of it, but I'm, I'm more than happy, of course, to wish uh, to move the motion S5M22521 in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask if any members wish to contribute to the debate on this motion? If not, uh, we will. Uh, that will conclude uh, the debate, and uh, I will therefore put the question. The question is that motion S five M two two five two one be approved. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes consideration of this motion, uh, and we will report to Parliament accordingly. Uh, and we will move uh, in a moment into a private session. I suspend this meeting, and we will resume in. A, in we will resume uh, at 11:50 uh, on a different platform. Thank you very much. I suspend this meeting.